the Love and Marriage Q&A session. I'm Judy Karanja. I am a relationships and spiritual wellness coach. I have been married for 24 years this year in June and I've been born again for over 33 years. I feel I have some experience and some tips that would be helpful to you if you want a happier and more fulfilling relationship. I thought this second question was excellent. Someone said, now that I'm in love, I'm looking forward to walk down the aisle. How do I prepare for marriage and not just the wedding? So good. So good. That's a mature person. I think you've asked such an important question. We spend so much time planning for wedding. There are wedding shows all over, not marriage shows. There are wedding songs, not marriage songs. There's poetry about weddings, but not so much or enough about marriage. Remember, there is a marriage after the wedding. The wedding is one day. The marriage is for life. You should not spend more time planning for a wedding than planning for the marriage. The wedding is the intro. The marriage is the event. So if you're smart, you will prepare for marriage. So I love that this person is thinking this way. Thumbs up and your question is going to help very many people. Number one, I'll give you a few tips. Attend a good premarital class. A good premarital class. We hope to begin our soon. We hope to put it online. Pray with us. I have coaches who are challenging me to do this. Um, I'm just getting training and the know-how of, of how to do this. We've done this premarital course for over 20 years and have taken many couples through it. But now we want to take it online so that you can tune in from anywhere else in the world. But even before then, there are many churches that have good premarital courses that will help you. Let me give you some qualities of a good one. All right, so that you can identify and even look at the course or if you ask for info, you can ask these questions, okay? A good premarital course is Bible-based. It's not teaching you Kikuyu tradition or Kalenjin tradition or Giriyama tradition. It's teaching you Bible tradition. This is what scripture says and this is what we are supposed to do. It highlights all that you need for a strong marriage foundation. All the foundation um Aspects of a good marriage, about your role as a husband and wife, about communication, about conflict resolution, about your first years of marriage, about involving God in the marriage, your finances, sex, about your relatives, all the foundational principles that will help you start well and set you off to a good journey. They handle that. I remember someone who came to us for premarital counseling <laughs> because they went to pastor for counseling and the pastor was Amze and he said, <laughs> he had nothing to say because to him premarital counseling was just the sex talk. That is just one tiny little bit of premarital counseling. And yes, that's an important one. That a good premarital class will prepare you for sex. It will it will show you the physical aspects of it, the spiritual rules concerning it, and even help you help the woman or, or direct her to get gynecological um, tests and uh, gynecology tests and um, what do you call it? Birth control methods that work with her, share with you guys what the detriments are and the benefits are, are for each. That's another aspect of a good premarital class. It will help you to understand your roles and to carry them out. It will help you to think and plan as a team and to set goals. It will empower you, this one is crucial, to question your past. There are things that the person you're going to marry deserves to know. Otherwise, you are engaging in fraud. You are making them sign their lives away to you on the dotted line without giving them all the details. If you are to partner with a business and they have challenges, difficulties, bankruptcies, or weaknesses that they do not tell you about, then it will be considered fraud when you do find out about them in future. I know people tell you, don't say the body count. And I'm not saying you're not supposed to say the body count. First of all, why do you even have a body count? I'm just using that as an example. But your spouse has every right to know um, about your financial situation. Who are you supporting? Are you in debt? Your sex life um, who have you slept with? Do you have any children? Does anybody call you daddy? Is anybody called by your name? Who will we live with when we get married? A good premarital class helps you to question the past in a way that is to bring 
understanding, accountability, and openness, not condemn and destroy the relationship, and also helps you to anticipate and plan for the future. It helps you to anticipate problems and learn strategies to overcome them. You will fight. You will have bad problems. You will think the marriage is over. You will wonder if you married the right person. It brings reality. It gives you a reality check to stop dreaming. It is not happily ever after like Disney movies. So this is what a good class will help you with. It will answer your questions if you have any. It will guide you with the basics about um, wedding planning and push you where that is concerned. It helps you. Family planning, I've mentioned that. Informs you and helps you to test for HIV. Another test that you may need to take. This is crucial. If there are conditions that could affect the other person are transmissible to the other person. It will encourage you and direct you to take this test. You don't have to tell them the results, but you do need to tell each other and discuss with each other and helps you to resolve conflicts. So the number two thing you can do to prepare for marriage, not just the wedding, associate with happily married couples. Uh, they say you're the average of the five people you spend most of your time with. If all your friends are girls who hate men, a girls who are pango candles, a girls who are slay queens, a men who hate women, a men who go to the club to for women to drop it like it's hot, <laughs> and they they love um, prostitutes and one night stands. It's gonna affect your marriage. If you're only associating with couples who don't respect each other, who are consistently fighting and being rude to each other, it will affect your marriage. So you need people who have good marriages who love each other, who respect each other, who are openly honorable towards each other. These people will motivate you. They will hold you accountable. If you allow them to, they can pray with you and even walk with you this journey. Number three, build your work and your business first. You want to be ready for a marriage and not just a wedding? Don't just go ask people for money to support a wedding. Build a business and career first before you marry. I know you're in love and all that, but love does not pay bills. Kenya Power will not say, oh my goodness, look how they're holding hands. We are waving this month of electricity bills. Nobody cares. <laughs> I know your love is all that, but the world is saying, we don't care. <laughs> money answers all things. How are you going to make that money? It's actually scriptural. Proverbs 24, 27 Prepare your work outside. Get everything ready for yourself in the field. And after that, build your house. Field first, then your house. I know churches that do not marry you if you have no job. No record of ever having a job. No plans of ever getting a job. This does not mean you cannot marry someone who is struggling. Someone can be through a season of struggle, but they have evidence of of working, of being responsible. They're constantly going out there, putting out their CVs, going for interviews, even doing what they can with their hands to make money. They're not sitting in the sitting room the whole day, uh, watching series and soccer and uh, being on social media, saying God will make a way, or why is the world against me? That is a sign of trouble. They are not consultants that you never know where, they're just mysterious. You don't know where they work or how they earn and they can never tell you. It's just so complicated. Build your outside work first. Make sure you're able to pay the bills and to take care of a bride and to take care of your groom and to handle responsibilities together. All right? Number four, leave your father and mother. You want to prepare for marriage and not just a wedding. Leave. Leave. Physically get out. Of your father and mother's presence. You're no longer a child. You're starting your own home. Live in your mindset. Live. Sometimes you have to leave that culture. God told Abraham, leave. Your father and mother, leave that household. Leave that culture. I'm doing something new. And then it also says, uh, Genesis 2, 24. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall be one flesh. Leave that control. Live emotionally. Know that you're starting your own home. All right. And it says cleave. So leave first, then cleave. Unite. Agree. Gel. Bond. Prioritize your wife. Make her the number one. You want a good marriage, not just a good wedding. Put that woman at the top of your human relationship list. 
after relationship with Jesus, this is your most important relationship. And you don't have to be rude about it or arrogant about it, but everyone needs to know this because family can get very territorial. They loved you. Maybe you are blessing them. Maybe you are taking them out. Maybe you are spending on them, but now you have new responsibilities and they'll be saying, Nikiki, Ikiki, sister in law, since she came, our brother is so stingy. Or since he came, our sister doesn't see us every day. Yes, that is part of life. Grow up. People leave their childhood home and build another home and commit to that home. It was a privilege and a pleasure for them to be available to you all the time and their money to be generous with you all the time. But now they must prioritize their marriage and their children. All right. And the third one is leave, cleave, but don't abandon. It says leave, don't abandon. It means they don't no longer control you. It means they no longer determine or demand for your finances. You give only cheerfully. All right. But you still love them. You're still uh, cordial with them. You're still considerate. You will go for birthdays, anniversary. You will do visits. You will help where you can and where you're led to. But your number one priority, you want a good marriage, leave your father and mother, cleave to your wife. Study good books, number five, about marriage and marital issues. Study to show yourself approved. Scripture says people study for a career. People even go to school to learn how to drive. People study to run a business and then they think they're going to wing it with marriage. Go to that class and then study books. Understanding is good. Ignorance is not bliss. It will make you struggle in marriage. Challenge yourself. You know the way many people read finance books, motivational books. Actually, you should be doing a marriage book at least every month. Build. There are people who've been through it and they have wisdom that will help you. Build your library. Read and study Together or separately, it doesn't matter as long as the information comes in and you apply it. I'm going to give you eight. This is number six. Pray about your future marriage. Pray, pray, pray. I would give you a story, but I don't want this to be too long. Declare scripture. Pray about your marriage bed being holy and undefiled. Pray about your faithfulness to each other and your sexual purity. Pray about agreement and harmony as you're planning the wedding. Pray about success and anointing on your wedding day. We met with my husband and every time we met, we prayed. We prayed, we worshiped God and we declared the word over our marriage and our wedding. Let me tell you, if you knew how much we fought when we were dating, that, those are things people don't talk enough about. But pray, pray and invite God to your wedding. Pray over the bridal couple, the parents, attendants, ministers and everything, every detail. And then pray about provision, pray about your future, pray about your children. Find scripture and pray. Number seven, how to prepare for a marriage, not just a wedding. Make the number one item on your wedding budget, the rent and groceries for the first month. And the bills for the first month. Wedding budget, all right? Number one, rent, groceries, bills for the first month. There is a marriage after the wedding. After you've bought rings, CG from where? For 200k. And a cake for 200k. And you bought a dress that someone brought you from Paris for 850k. And you had that goat that's rotating at your wedding. And everyone is happy and they've gone to their home. What are you going to sleep in? Is your house furnished? Is there food? <laughs> are you going to be able to pay electricity or are you going to be in the dark? After the honeymoon in the Maldives. Prepare for the marriage. Make that your first item first. And the final one, uh, these are some scriptures about preparation. Luke 14, 28, for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Count the cost. Am I able to complete life with this man? Am I able to do life with this woman? Are they going to wear me out and kill me? Am I able to handle their finances? Will I be able with their demands and their lifestyle? <laughs> Be honest. The Bible gives you the right to count the cost. Ecclesiastes 10.10. 10, a dull axe requires more, more strength. Be wise. Sharpen your blade. Preparation is sharpening your blade. You don't just fall into marriage. You fell in love and you fell into a wedding and you fell into marriage. Plan. Sharpen your axe. Anticipate. Prepare. Study. Ask questions. Learn. Learn. Then you will have a good marriage and not just 